So the talk indeed is going to be about um, approximate sparse regression problems. And this is a joint work with Aurelia, who was my uh, PhD student uh, for a while in, in, in Brussels. This is a paper uh, that we presented together at the SWAT conference uh, last year. So what is it uh, about? Uh, sparse regression is also known as sparse approximation. It's a problem that studied in the signal processing community, image processing community, machine learning. People also know about this. It's this idea of um, trying to uh, explain observations or a signal in terms of a sparse combination of atoms of, the, of a dictionary. So you have those uh, redundant dictionaries uh, that uh, represent actually underdetermined uh, linear system, and you want to find approximate solution to this linear system, or yeah, good solutions to this linear system that are also sparse. What does that mean? Sparsity is typically defined in terms of the number of non-zero components of the combination that you look for. Okay, uh, this is sometimes called the L zero pseudo norm. Okay, just the number of components that are uh, different from zero. So the exact definition of the problem would be something uh, like this. You're given a matrix A, a rectangular matrix, D times N, and you can think of N as being much larger than D. You're giving a target vector Y and an integer K, and you want to find an approximate solution to the system AX equals Y with X satisfying some property. Sparsity first, so the number of non-zero components should be bounded. And then you can add, because it, N is large, you can, you can add you know, constraints on your solution. And one typical constraint is that this combination you look for should be an affine combination. So uh, the sum of the components of X should be equal to one. Uh, you can also think of the problem in which you add the constraint that the components are positive. This would be a, a convex combination or just drop this constraint in which you just have a linear combination. So wh why do I say combination? Because X is really on K distinct components is really selecting the columns of A, right? And construct a linear combination or an affine combination of the columns of A that are as close as possible to the target vector Y. Okay, is the problem clear? And you're given this, this matrix A, the target vector and the, the, the sparsity constraint, and you wanna find such a solution that is the best approximation to AX equals Y with those sparsity and uh, affine combination constraints. Um, this is the way that the problem is cast in the signal processing literature, but maybe you want to have a computational geometry's version of it, right? Uh, and uh, this would look like this. Um, we just look at the n columns of the matrix A and think of them as points in D space. Okay, so you have n points in R to the D you got this integer k, which is the sparsity constraint. And you can, without loss of generality, suppose that y is actually the origin, okay? Just set y equals zero, you can translate everything. If you're given a together with y, you can, this is without loss of generality. And then the goal there is to find k points of s, such that the distance from the origin to the affine hull is as small as possible, okay? so you want to find an affine combination that is as close as possible to the origin of your space. This is the uh, nearest induced flat problem, okay, or nearest induced hull, affine hull problem. So you look at the affine hull of the K points and you, 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 you want to find in there, you want to find something that is close uh, to, to your target. Is the problem clear? So here's, a, here's an example, for instance, very simple example for d equals two and k equals two, you're given your origin, which is your, your target. You wanna be as close as possible to the origin. And you want to select an affine combination of, of two points of your set. So the points of the set are the little white dots there. So for instance, you could pick those two. The final is the blue line there. You just look at, because k equals two, the final is a line. And you wanna find the line, the line that is close to, to the origin, okay? So you wanna find, a point on this line that's close to the origin. So maybe you can find this point, but if you select two other points, you, you can get bet, a better solution. For instance, if you take this one, the, the line there is, is closer, okay? Maybe the best solution would be this one, all right? 
So this is the nearest induced flat problem for g equals k uh, equals two. So the nearest line that is induced by a pair of points uh, in, in your set. So there's, of course, a trivial algorithm that consists of checking all possible k pairs or in general k tuples, okay? So there is a natural n to the k algorithm for this problem. Um, what's been done before? So it's known that if, if k is not, is part of the input, right? If k is not fixed, then the problem is NP hard, okay? Uh, there are many versions of it. There are many different proofs in different contexts. I mean, one of them is, is from 1995. It's exactly uh, this problem, but you can find many others. And it's, I guess, not very surprising that the problem is hard if, if you don't fix uh, the value k. So in some sense, what we look at is a, is a fixed parameter version of this, where the sparsity constraint is, is not part of the input, but it's part of the problem. Um, so quite recently, there's been this paper from uh, Pankaj Agarwal, Nathan Rubin, and Misha Shahe. Um, I think it was an ESA paper in 2017, where they look at this problem of having a, a constructing a data structure for um, k flats in D space. Okay, so you have a dictionary of, of flats of dimension k in D space, and you have you can query this data structure. You you query it with a point, and you want to find for every query point the flat that is the closest to this point, okay? And they show how to do this with um, storage that is roughly n to the k plus one, assuming that d is a constant and ignoring polylog factors, okay? And this is both the storage and the pre-processing time, so constructing the data structure and storing it. And if with this storage and pre-processing time, they manage to have polylog n query time, okay? So I give you a point and uh, the data structure gives me the closest flat in the in the dictionary. It is not our problem because here we look at the closest induced flat. Okay, so it's the closest combination. But we could use it uh, by looking at all possible combinations, storing it in this dictionary, and having polylog n query time. Okay, so this is something that we can use, but it's a bit of an overkill because we feel that our problem is more structured. Right, we're looking among among searching among specific. Uh, flat, those that are induced by, by, by subsets of points. Um, there's one other recent paper that deals exactly with the problem that we, we just defined, which is by Arpelet, Indik, and, and Mahabadi, um, yeah, like three years ago. And they look at the data structure version of it. And then they show that if there exists a approximate nearest neighbor data structure with pre-processing time S and query time Q, where S and Q depend on uh, N, the number of points, the dimension and the approximation factor, then they can pre-process the, pre the input um, point set in time N to the K minus one times S and answer queries in N to the K minus one times Q um, time. Okay, so they sort of managed to reduce the problem of searching the nearest induced flat to the nearest neighbor search problem with a uh, additional factor of n to the k minus one. So remember the trivial algorithm is n to the k, okay? So this n to the k minus one is a linear speed up compared to the trivial algorithm, okay? And you may hope that maybe nearest neighbor search in fixed dimension d and fixed epsilon should be like also uh, log time. So you have something like n to the k minus one uh, log time for if you fix those parameters. Uh, so this is, this is what they did. And um, the question that we, we asked, and I thought that something could be done there, is what can be done without pre-processing, okay? I just gave you the set of points, and I ask you what's the closest thing used flat, you know, to the origin, okay? So the sort of the offline version of the problem. And uh, what we managed to show is that actually we can get similar running time for the problem without pre-processing. So something like n to the k minus one polylog. So this is the complete statement that for any positive real epsilon and constant positive d and k, and those are must be constant, there's a randomized approximation algorithm for the nearest induced flat running in this expected uh, time. And, um, and I'm hiding there constant factors in, in the big O 
there are constant factors that depend on d uh, and epsilon. Okay, k is at most d. Uh, otherwise, it's it's the problem is trivial. And um, but there's something like a one over epsilon to the d hiding there. But those are assumed to be constant, so 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 this should be fine. Okay, so this is the main the main result, and I'll mention this try to give you a flavor of the proof of this this uh, this statement and and how the algorithm works, and then some variants of it. So first, okay, n to the k minus one might seem maybe you know not great. Like if k is large, you know this is still a big big polynomial, but actually it most probably the best the best we can do and there's a good reason for this and there's sort of a conditional lower bound that depends on some um say maybe conjecture on the complexity of a fine degeneracy testing so the the simplest version of it is is i give you a set of endpoints in the plane are there three points that are collinear right it's nobody knows how to do this in subquadratic time even even weekly subquadratic time so this is sort of the conjecture that we rely on to say that n to the k minus one is probably, you know, close to the best we can we can do, or at least we can currently hope for. So first, I'll explain a, a simple version of of the problem in dimension three, in which you look for the nearest induced line. So this is the same problem as the first illustration I gave you, just in three D, right? And actually, all the ingredients are already there, and to 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 define the the uh, the generic algorithm for arbitrary D and K. Like we, everything is, is for the nearest induced line problem in 3D, uh, all the tools are already, already set up for the, for the generic version. And it's slightly more complicated, but uh, there's no big gap. Uh, there's a special interesting case of the problem, which is actually also illustrated in the first uh, toy example that, that I showed you, uh, in which uh, D equals K. And there, the flat that you're looking for that's induced by, by k points is actually a hyperplane. Okay, and there you can leverage like uh, the, the, some, some methods that are related to hyperplane arrangements to, to do this in a slightly more clever way and uh, without the approximation factor, actually. So using cuttings and stuff, you can, you can actually find an exact answer to this question. So I'll try to give you a, a, also a glimpse of, of this case. And then um, I also look at the problem in which you, you replace the, um, you remember the sum of the xi must be equal to one. This is, there you're looking for an affine combination that approximates your, your, your target. What if you look for a convex combination? So you add, in, in addition, the constraint that uh, the components must be uh, positive, okay? And there you're not looking at the closest induced flat, but the closest induced simplex uh, from k points. And actually, Again, we can we can push our ideas further and, and make this work. Uh, also, n to the k minus one. Questions at this this stage is is the problem clear? Is is the plan clear? Please feel free to interrupt. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So far, so good. Thanks. Okay. So um, what did I say? Lower bound. So um, a fine degeneracy testing. So in, in computational geometry, it's common to refer to this as a you know, general position, you know, let n, you know, as be n points in general position. Uh, what does that mean? No three points on the line, typically. Okay. So in dimension D, it would mean no D plus one points on a hyperplane, on a fine hyperplane. Okay. Um, so this could be called general position testing, right? I give you a set of points. Are there some affine degeneracies in that sense? Okay, are there a set of, is, can you find a set of D plus one points that all lie on the same uh, hyperplane? And um, okay, this is, uh, I just mentioned two, you know, well-known references about this. It's something that's been studied by, by people in the, in the CG community, like, like uh, Jeff Erickson and, and Bernard Chazelle and, and, and Okay, we don't know how to do this in in uh, in n to the d minus something positive time. Okay, so it seems that okay, we're probably not able to do this in 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 less than n to the d time. Uh, and this this you can use as a computational assumption, right? You can say okay, this is uh, like use this as a base problem for conditional uh, lower bounds, right? And uh, it's it's actually a, a, a quite easy observation that 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 was done by by 
by Sahel and, and others in this in this previous paper, that uh, if the nearest induced flat can be approximated in time less than n to the k minus one, then you can also solve the affine degeneracy problem in time less than n to the d. Okay, and I, I just read the, the strong versions here in which better means with a smaller exponent in n. Okay, not just Chevin logs in. And um, and the thing is is really if you, if you query uh, if you look for the closest uh, induced flat and you realize that actually uh, the closest is at, is at distance zero, then that means uh, that you, and, and if this flat is a hyperplane, that means you, you, you have found a degeneracy, right? So if you can do that in, uh, in, in less than n to the k minus one, you can do this n times and, and get something that's faster than n to the d, okay? So condition on this hypothesis that Okay, we cannot do better than n to the d for fine degeneracy testing. Then n to the k minus one is the best we can do uh, for this this closest induced flat problem. Okay, um, but still, all the methods that that have been around uh, use some preprocessing. So they they look at the data structure problem and not the offline problem. So let's see what we can do. Um, the main ideas are the, the following. The, the first one is, the, the first two are sort of standard ideas. The first one is actually borrowed from the, the paper by uh, Agarwal Rubin and, and Shahe on the, uh, this, this uh, data structure for K flats. And it's the idea of approximating the Euclidean distance by a polyhedral distance, okay? So you replace the ball, the Euclidean ball by, by some, some polyhedron, okay? And uh, since you assume it's, of course it's this, this this bit of cheating where we assume that the dimension and the epsilon are constant. And then we can have those polyhedra who, whose complexity is, is like something like one over epsilon to the D, but they're constant size and they, they can approximate as, as, as well as you want the Euclidean distance. And, uh, and then we just look at the structure of this polytope, this, this polyhedron that, that we use and, and, and work on, on this in, in, uh, in sort of a, uh, a discrete uh, non-algebraic way, right? And and this is this is actually the only source of approximation in our algorithm. This is the only part where this this is where the one plus epsilon comes from, and the rest is exact. Okay, so in fact we have an exact algorithm for uh, the nearest induced flat problem for polyhedral distances. Okay. Uh, the second idea that's also well known is is uh, is the that we reduce to the decision problem. And uh, there are many ways to do this. Uh, also, there's a, you know, a, a bag of tricks in computational geometry for uh, reducing from the optimization to the decision problem. Um, of course, a bisection, a biometric search, and so on. And, and one neat idea is, is that from Chan, in which you can have, you can reduce the optimization, like the closest, you know, say closest pair to a decision problem. Is there a pair at distance, you know, some fixed distance? or yeah, some object has some fixed distance. And you can do this without, without any uh, log factor and you get an expected running time. Uh, the expected running time is the same as the uh, running time of the decision problem. So this is one neat trick. And then maybe the, uh, the actual uh, sort of newish contribution there is uh, the fact that we can reduce the decision problem uh, to a sequence of uh, searches uh, in orthogonal ranges. So we use orthogonal range searching, actually range emptiness, orthogonal range emptiness queries uh, for uh, solving the uh, decision problem. Uh, and, and this is where, you know, where we manage to shave this, this linear factor of the trivial algorithm uh, to get from n to the k to n to the k minus one. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through these, these ideas. First, the polyhedral approximation. I, I think this is, this is exactly what you think it is, right? So you, you have a polyhedron Q and then the distance that's centered on, on, on the point, your, your, your target point. And then the distance, um, the polyhedral distance with respect to Q from this point to, uh, to another is just the minimum lambda such that lambda Q contains the other points, okay? And lambda Q is the dilation of the polyhedron Q by a factor lambda. And this is this lambda is, uh, is your distance, is your polyhedral distance. And provided that the, the polygon Q, uh, the polyhedron Q is sufficiently complex and there are bounds on this and it's, it's sort of well documented, um, you can approximate the Euclidean distance as, as well as you want. So there's this uh, 
this uh, paper from Dudley that does this in a very general way. But here it's it's um, I mean, as simple as as it gets, and um, and you have bounds on the complexity of the polyhedron Q for a fixed epsilon, and it's again yeah I mentioned this already, epsilon to the minus big O B. So this is the the first the first idea. Um, okay, a, a few words on on chance methods. So this is the complete the complete lemma uh, that he published in in uh, yeah twenty years ago now. Um, so if you can split uh, your problem, the problem P of size N on which you want to uh, compute the solution F of P, if you can split your problem into R sub problems, okay, each of size a fraction of the size of the initial problem. And you can do that in such a way that the function you want to compute is the minimum of the function over all sub problems. Okay. If furthermore you can decide, you know, you can solve the decision problem in some time d of n, and you can do the splitting in time d of n, then you can actually compute the function f in time big O of d of n in expectation. Okay. So if your problem can be nicely decomposed in this way, such that what you look for is the minimum over all sub problems, then you can solve the, the problem of computing this function as fast as deciding whether this function is above some given threshold t, okay? And then how do you do that? And it's, it's also a very standard trick, right? But uh, how do you do this for this, this nearest? Um, so it's been done for nearest neighbor. How do you do this for this nearest uh, induced flat problem? When you just pick uh, your set S and you split it. So I'm, I'm describing the partition here in, in sub problems into R equals K plus one subset. Okay, minus k plus one, not k, of roughly equal sizes. Okay, so you split essentially uh, n over k plus one. Okay, and now you define the k plus one subproblems on the point set that are the union of all the sj except i. Okay, so subproblem pi is uh, the union of uh, all the the subsets that are different uh, sj with j different from i. Okay. And from there, you can see that each subproblem has size k divided by k plus one. Okay, you pick k subset among the k plus one subset. So you can set alpha equals k to the k plus one. And now, because we pick k plus one subset, then any uh, k tuple that you might look for will be found in one of the uh, k plus one subproblems. Okay, so you will not miss any k subset by splitting the problem in this way. You will have a constant fraction of the points in every subset, and you have k plus one subset, which is also a constant. So by setting r to this constant and alpha k over k plus one, you can reduce the uh, closest, you know, finding the closest problem to deciding whether the distance is, a, is, is less than some given threshold t, okay? So this is, okay, one uh, standard trick, but it, it's really useful here because now, uh, we can just look at this, the simple problem, which is I use this, I have this polyhedron and I have some dilation lambda. Is there any induced a fine hull, induced flat that is now touching or intersecting my polyhedron? This is the only thing you have to look for, okay? And um, let me describe now the, the algorithm that, that we used to, to do this on the special case of the nearest induced line in R3, okay? Suppose the dimension is three and uh, k equals two, so you look uh, for a line induced by going through two points in free space, and you want to find the line that's closest to uh, the origin. So how do you do this? How do you solve this decision problem? Okay, so you have to decide whether for a given lambda, whether the dilation lambda q of your polyhedron for the polyhedral distance intersects a line through two points of s. Okay, so we reduce the problem to this. So how do you do this? You pick, you look at so think of this, this polyhedron and think of it as, as growing, you know, being scaled. And then at some point, it hits a line, okay? It typically hits a line uh, on an edge, right? So there will be one edge of the polyhedron that will come in contact with one line induced by a pair AB of points in S, okay? This is what usually will happen. So you look at all the edges of the polyhedron Q, Okay, and you do something for each 
edge of these polynomials, okay? And there's a constant number of them, right? If epsilon and z are constant, right? And then you pick this edge and with a correct dilation, okay? It's an edge of, um, yes, it's lambda e, okay? Where e is the edge. This, this should be lambda e in the figure here. And then you look at the convex cell, which is the triangle composed of lambda e, the convex cell of lambda e and, and the target point in the origin. Okay, so this forms a triangle in free space. And you want to decide whether there's a pair of points such that the line through these two points intersects the triangle. Okay, this is all you have to do. So we reduce now the problem to this, right? Whether there's a pair AB such that the line through AB intersects my triangle in free space. Okay, do you agree? Yes? So how do we do this? Well, we're gonna go through every point A and try to detect for every point A, whether there is a point B such that the line AB intersect the triangle delta. So delta is this convex hull of the origin and the edge of the polyhedron, okay? And then I'm going through every point A and then I wanna know, is there a B such that the line AB intersects delta, right? And for this, we construct, okay, we construct a data structure, okay? Beforehand, before checking for any A, we construct a data structure that is, that will be allowed to, will allow us to, to, to do this, right? So each point A now will be a query in this data structure. And the, the, the question is, is there any B in that range, okay? So what is the range of Bs such that the line AB intersect the triangle delta. It's this cone, right? It's the cone of apex A, right? And having this, the, the triangle on its boundary, right? Um, it's actually a double cone, right? Because B could be on the other side and the line AB could still go through delta. But because we look for every point, we, we can look from B and then we'll have the line AB, right? So we can restrict to this single cone there. And actually, uh, you can realize that the range of points B, such that the line AB intersects delta, is actually an orthogonal range in some, in some space, okay? So you can identify every point with the three angles that they make that the, uh, that the so, so for every point, you look at the plane that contains one edge of the triangle and the point, and the angle between this plane and the triangle will be one coordinate in the space. Right, And now here you have three coordinates. So you have a range, which is an orthogonal range. It's a rectangle in free space, right? In which you wanna look for a B. And orthogonal range searching can be done typically in polylog time, okay? And the data structure can be constructed also in N times polylog time, right? So you construct the data structure and then you query it for every A to look for a B such that the line AB intersect the, the, the triangle. And actually, if you're a little careful, you can remove the poly from the log. Actually, a single log is sufficient. You can construct the whole data structure and then log in time and answer every query in log in time. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the algorithm, right? We reduce to the decision problem. We pick every edge E of uh, our polyhedron. Uh, we look at these triangles and then we construct a data structure and we look for all the Bs in this data structure uh, to find to find a line, right? And if the answer, um, if we find one, well, we 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 do. Otherwise, that means the dilation is is too small, and and we just answer no. Is that clear? Questions on this? Clearly, it is me because John found it. But can you explain why it's an orthogonal branch searching? The branch searching, I understand, but not the orthogonal part. Yes. Okay. So think of, okay, look at, pick a point, they pick this point A, okay? And you measure three angles. Um, you, uh, you have the angle of say the pink plane here with that, the angle that it makes with, with the, the, uh, the triangle delta, okay? And then you have the same two other angles for the two other planes there, okay? And now the range that you search for, so what is the range of Bs? Uh, for which uh, 
the line will, will cross is the B such that the angle, say for with respect to the pink plane, oh. this angle will be uh, between the angle of A and, and minus this, okay? So there's, a, there's an interval on this angle of length um, uh, pi over two, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is the range you wanna search in, on, on this coordinate, right? And then you can do this for the two others, right? And you just multiply those intervals and this will, this will be a box in 3D. Very cool, yeah, thank you. Right, is that, is that? Yeah, 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 I got now? it now, <laughs> at least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this is, this is the cool thing. It's, it's, it's orthogonal, right? If, 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 if you had to do simplex range searching, then we would have been in trouble, right? Maybe you could, you could shave something sublinear, but not a complete, uh, yeah, an over log n factor, right? So the fact that they're orthogonal is, is really the thing that helps you. Other questions? No? Okay, th thanks, Mathieu. Um, so this is, this is the statement. Actually, uh, for d equals three and k equals two, we can do it in n log n time. So one plus epsilon approximation in, uh, in n log n time. Um, so what about the general case? Uh, it's really a, a sort of straightforward generalization of, of, of what I just said. It's sort of slightly harder to think of it because you know they're, <laughs> it's higher dimensional, but it's really the same thing. So we will now look instead of edges, uh, we will not look. We will now look at d minus k faces of Q. Okay, so faces of dimension d minus k, because this is the dimension of a face that typically hits an affine hull of you know induced by by k points in d space, right? This is typically what what happens, and um, we want to know whether there exist k points whose affine hull intersects the simplex that is the convex com the convex uh, convex hull of uh, the target point uh, O and uh, lambda times this uh, this phase. Um, so suppose that we have let me maybe first give uh, an example. So suppose that we look for um, uh, three points. So we have k equals three. So this is a hyperplane case. Uh, we have k equals three and, and, and we're in, we in free space, okay? So we want to find a plane that's induced by three points that is as close as possible to our target point O, okay? Then it's likely that our polyhedron Q when growing will hit this plane on a vertex, right? Think of it, you have a plane and then you have a polygon that is growing. Typically it hits the plane on a vertex unless something is degenerate, right? So one endpoint of this delta is uh, the vertex that I'm, I'm it, think of it as a, a edge shooting, right? It's an edge of dimension zero. And the other one is your target point, the origin, okay? This is, this is your delta, okay? And, um, and now you wanna find triples of point A1, A2, and A3, that it should be somewhere, right? Such that uh, the plane that they induce intersects this line segment delta. All right. This is this is a situation now. So there's no there's not only uh, two points now, but three. Okay. And uh, so what is the range that you're searching? So suppose you fix the first two points. Remember the the, the budget we have is n to the k minus one, right? E k equals three. So we can fix two points and we search for the third one. And we're going again to search in a in a data structure. So what is the locus of the points a three such that the plane supporting, I mean, containing A1, A2, A3, so the affine hull that is a plane of A1, A2, A3 intersects the line segment delta. What is it? Well, A3 must be either below, simultaneously below the green and the pink plane here, or simultaneously above, right? If it's somewhere here, then the plane will miss the line segment, right? Same here. But if it's above both planes, or below both planes, then the plane A1, A2, A3 will intersect the line segment delta. Do you see this? So we have also a definition, a good definition of the ranges that we want to search in our data structure to find the cave point. Okay, we wanted to find the second point that was B, you know, to find a, a line 
that intersect the triangle delta. Here we want to find a third point. So in general, we fix the first k minus one points and we want to find the kth point such that the induced affine hull uh, is, hits our, uh, our simplex delta. This is, this is in general. So we have this general condition here. So suppose that you have a k tuple uh, a1, a2, a k of points, which is your candidate k tuple, right? And you ask whether this k tuple has an affine hull, a flat, defines a flat that intersects uh, your simplex delta. And we denote by b1 to b d minus k plus two, uh, this is the dimension of the simplex, the simplex delta. Uh, these are the vertices of, of delta, okay? So we define d minus k plus two hyperplane. So one for each such vertex of delta. And they're the affine hulls of everybody but the kth point. So that the, the, the fine hull of a1, a2 up to a k minus one. And then of all of b except b i. And if you look in this example, this is what I did, right? I picked a1, a2 to a k minus one. Okay, so the first two points. And then only one of the two vertices of the line segment delta. Right. So here I define two points because delta has two vertices. It's a, it's a one simplex, right? But in general, you have D minus K plus two hyperplane. And now the final of A intersects your simplex delta if and only if AK is in this, this region here. So it's the union of being above all hyperplanes or being below all hyperplanes. Right, just as here, A3 induces a plane intersecting the line segment delta, if and only if it's above both planes or below both planes. Okay, so that, I mean, I'm just showing you it works on this example, but it really works in general. This is the statement. And if you look at those hyperplanes, same thing, they define circular orders, right? And you can do range searching exactly the same way as we did for the line, the closest line problem. So given a1, a2 up to a k minus one, I can search in the data structure for the kth point, whether there is a kth point such that this condition is satisfied, whether there is a kth point that falls in this, in this range, right? So by changing spaces and looking at angles, as I explained, um, you can turn this into, you can, you can leverage orthogonal range searching uh, data structures, actually range emptiness uh, data structures. So here's, how you do it. So you first pick, consider all possible k minus two subset of points, okay? That's a loop that's doing n to the k minus two iterations. And now we're gonna look at the k minus one point. And for each of these possible k minus one point, I'm gonna do a query in the data structure. So I first have to build this data structure. And this data structure will be an orthogonal range emptiness query data structure uh, in dimension d minus k plus two. Right, this is the number of hyperplanes we had. And now for each point, k minus one point, candidate for the k minus one point, that's not already there. I am querying this data structure twice, actually. Once for the intersection of uh, the h plus half spaces and once for the intersection of the h minus um, half spaces, right? I can do this twice. And those are two orthogonal range queries that we can do in polylog n time. Um, and we return yes only if at some point uh, one query uh, return no. So with their emptiness, I mean, there's a double negation there. Their emptiness query, so if the, an the answer is no, that means we have found a point. Uh, so yes, the distance is smaller than, than the threshold that we set. I mean, we can answer the decision problem if we know this. Now steps one, step one takes time and polylog n, okay? This is building the data structure, right? And um, we can do those queries in polylog n time, right? And we do this n times, right? So step two as a whole performs n polylog n operations also, right? And the main loop is n to the k minus two, right? So overall it's n to the k minus one polylog, okay? It's just the same thing, but instead of fixing, uh, the querying for the first point, you first fix the k minus two points, and then you query, you do one query or two queries in that case for each candidate k minus one point. Okay, so this is how you spare. I mean, this is the part where you, you shave the linear factor, 
right, of, of, the, of the trivial algorithm. Like you replace the searching for the k point by, by queries in the data structure. Is that clear? I mean, I'm skipping details, of course. Uh, I mean, I'm, you don't have to be convinced that, you know, uh, these are actually, uh, you know, uh, nice orthogonal ranges. I mean, th there's a number of details I'm skipping, of course, but the idea is, is, is really the same. Any question? Making sense? Good. So there's one special case that we investigated a, a, a little more, uh, which is the nearest induced hyperplane. So the, 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 the standard version, I mean, the simplest version is maybe uh, looking for a line, induced line in two space, right? And there we can show that we don't need we can solve it in n to the d minus one time. So we have, we have uh, okay, for a plus plus delta for any positive delta, okay? But we can solve it exactly in that case, right? And then we don't use the polyhedral approximation anymore, but uh, instead we harness the uh, power of, of also standard tools in computational geometry uh, involving, I mean, yeah, involving hyperplane arrangements. Uh, the zone theorem, like the complexity of a zone in a, in a hyperplane arrangement and, and, and a version of cuttings that allow us to, uh, you know, restrict the search to a, a sufficiently small uh, subset of candidates that we can search exhaustively by picking the dual arrangement and looking at the zone of a hyperplane, which corresponds to a target point. Okay, I'm, I'm going through this sort of quickly, just mentioning it that in that case, uh, we have the same running time, but we have an exact algorithm with a completely different method. Okay. Um, and then one word maybe uh, on, uh, on another variant, which is the nearest induced simplex. So in, if instead of looking for a solution that not only uh, sums to one, a combination whose coefficient sums to one, but also that are positive, then we're looking for a convex combination. Okay. And then the problem becomes uh, geometrically, it becomes a problem of finding k points such that the convex hull of these k points is as close as possible to your target point. Not the affine hull anymore, but the convex hull. Okay, and the convex hull of k points for k less than d is some simplex, you know, in d space. And um, and there we can again compute the minimum polyhedral distance. Okay. And again, reduce you know to the decision problem. I mean, it's all all the same, um, except that now, if you think of remember, I, I did these things with my hand that this, the polygon is is growing. Say maybe you look for a plane and you're in three D. Then clearly, the polyhedron is going to hit the plane on a vertex, right? Typically. Well, if instead of some of a flat, what you have, you know, here as a, so, so the thing that you look for and want to be close, if you have a simplex, then there are many combinations of dimensions of faces from the polyhedron and from the simplex hitting each other, right? So you have to be a little more careful here, right? Because the, the scale polyhedron lambda Q can intersect the convex hull of, of the K tuple on a face of dimension D minus T for any T essentially. So you have to go through all of them. But it's not a big deal. We can deal with this by going through every t. And actually, uh, the larger, the smaller t will dominate. Uh, sorry, the larger t will dominate. Okay, so if you take t equals k, this would be the worst case. And, and, and the, the whole complexity will be dominated by this anyway. And we have the same, uh, same, you know, condition, intersection condition, we can apply the same algorithm, just that instead of checking for uh, remember this intersection of positive has spaces, union intersection of negative has spaces. We have now two different kinds of hyperplanes, right? And uh, k-tuple intersects the simplex delta. Uh, so, sorry, the convex hull of the k-tuple intersects the simplex delta only if uh, the last point lies in this range. Okay, so it's looking similar. I'm skipping details here because, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's a bit boring and, and, and abstract at this stage, but maybe I can just give you an example. So suppose that again, k equals d equals three. So you're looking for three points and you want to find three points that induce a triangle that intersect the line segment delta here. Okay, what is the locus of the points A3? 
such that the triangle A1, A2, A3 intersects the line segment delta. Well, you want to look in that region below H1, G2, and, and the other green plane that below, below those four planes, actually. There are H1, H2, and G1, G2 in my definition. So the locus of point A3, such that the triangle intersects delta, is this thing below there. Okay, it's going you know down to infinity here. You agree with me that whenever wherever you place this point below here, the triangle will intersect delta. So this is just an application of this lemma in this special case, k equals d equals three. Okay, and here, for instance, if you're looking for a line, uh, but it's not a line anymore. No, you're looking for a line segment, you know, between a one and a two. Okay, that is closest to your target point, not a line, but a line segment, right? Then the locus of points A2, such that the line segment A1, A2 intersects the triangle delta in free space. Well, now you have to be below this triangle, right? You have to be below delta. So you have an additional hyperplane here, G1, below which you want to be, okay? So you just have to adapt your ranges, right, to search for the case point. But it still works. You can do this. And we have this, this algorithm that's also n to the k minus 1 polylog, where poly is you know, depends on Z, for uh, the nearest induced simplex problem in, in, in D space. And again, the, yeah, the expected running time is, uh, yeah, it's expected thing from, um, because of chance method, this gives you an expected running time. Uh, for a few more logs, maybe one more log, uh, you can clearly turn this into a high probability algorithm, right? The expected thing doesn't, doesn't, it's, it's no big deal. Okay, so let me say a few words about what's done in practice. I mean, this is, uh, this is really of theoretical interest, right? In practice, of course, in signal processing community, people use very different things. Uh, they relax the sparsity condition. You may have heard of the lasso method. They apply some greedy algorithm. You may have heard of the matching post-read algorithm in signal processing. Those are very standard things. And the analysis, I mean, they show people, those people show these algorithms work, uh, provided that the data that you search with these algorithms, the, what they call the dictionary, you know, which is our set of points, has some structure, right? You may have heard of the restricted isometric property, uh, like RIP um, matrices from uh, compressed sensing. This is, this is what it's about, right? If your data has some structure, then actually some greedy algorithm for uh, finding those uh, sparse combination uh, work very well. But we don't have those hypotheses. And then we have this lower bound from uh, the generate, uh, find the generosity testing that tells us that no method, I mean, it, it's unlikely that, that uh, uh, say things like greedy method could do better in, in the very general case. Uh, so this is the first, uh, this is the first um, little law of n to the k, so non, this is essentially the first non-trivial algorithm uh, for this problem without preprocessing. Okay, this is, this is what it did. Um, yeah, Ohania talked about this at the symposium um, on algorithm theory uh, last year, and this is where it's published, and uh, it's, it's being revised. Hopefully there will be a, a revised version on, on archive soon out our paper. And I thank you very much for your attention. Please.